Welcome to Ask the Experts, a reoccurring panel discussion where industry-leading cleaning experts tackle the most difficult cleaning challenges that you and your brand face every day. So who are the experts? First, our host, Mike Perazzo. For nearly two decades, Mike's passion for the cleaning industry has transformed cleaning operations for Fortune 500 companies across the country. Nick Wiebe, with a decade of experience in cleaning solutions, Nick brings a process-oriented, results-driven approach to the toughest cleaning challenges. Dave Lanningham, a 12-year veteran of the cleaning industry, Dave uses out-of-the-box thinking to overhaul cleaning operations in retail and grocery operations. And Alan Randolph, with over 40 years of experience in all facets of the cleaning world, Alan brings a wealth of knowledge and solutions to help facilities maximize their cleaning effectiveness. With over a hundred years of combined experience, there isn't a challenge they haven't taken on. And now, our experts take on their most exciting challenge yet, helping you with yours. If I was doing ATP and I understood those fundamentals, it's about driving that number as low as I can. You gotta make sure that we have the right amount of chemical mixed in with the right amount of water. If you just throw disinfectant at a surface without removing the gross soils, what have we done? This is called an ATP meter, and this allows you to do rapid verification. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, today was wild, okay? Just let's, let's bring it to what happens in the real real, okay? I'm here this morning and uh, get a call from IT. He says, hey man, do you want a coffee this morning? Of course I want a coffee, it'd be a great way to start. Problem was only two made it in the building. The other two went down into the floorboard of the Toyota Tacoma. So things got weird quick. I, of course, pivot, go into action, grab a machine, and then what did you see from there? Well, I'm driving in the parking lot and I saw somebody who asked an expert because <laughs> right. you're racing to the scene with the right tools jump into action we went into recovery mode i and, jump uh, out of the rental jeep and a uh, few minutes later he is right where he needed to be yeah so i was in recovery mode today had to get the vacuum out needless to say the tacomas never look cleaner because we <laughs> removed two dark roast coffees from a and, gray floor and some board. and some footprints there was definitely the some big question is did you actually get one of the remaining two coffees or no i did all I, right so mine good. survived all right there was two people in the office dauber was two down <laughs> theirs did not show up right not, but uh power of vacuum extraction showed up uh asked the expert happened to be there so i mean news team assembly yeah. right. we did it gotta win all right I want to get to our favorite part of this, which is obviously to provide direct feedback from our audience who are constantly kind of sending in questions. We're getting a pulse from where the industry's at, what they're thinking. Uh, we're getting into the back half of the year. Um, school season is back in. You know, um, we're seeing retail grocery kind of prepare for the holiday season. It's hard to believe that the year is almost up. So there's a lot going on in our industry. Um, and so some of these questions will be fun to kind of sort through and we'll kind of provide some context where everyone's at. But um, this is my favorite part. What are people thinking? What, what do they want to hear from us? And so, you know, not a simple question, number one. I, may, I am going to start with you, Alan, is, you know, some people are really reevaluating what they're doing with their cleaning program. The part I love about the industry is people want to improve. They want to drive a better <clears throat> outcome, but sometimes they're not really sure where to start. So this first question was, if I am someone who's looking to improve my overall cleaning program, you know, where do I really start? How do we approach selecting the key areas? And if there was one area that maybe we could kind of tackle together, what would that focus be? I think it's almost always the restroom. It is the one place that is the most that's looked at with the most critical eye by both the workers in the building and people who visit a building and it doesn't matter what building it is if you're in food service there's tons of studies that say if the restroom's not clean they're not sure if you're making the food safely and hygienically if you're in a school like people are using the restroom and they're thinking about your brand they're thinking about your educational content the restroom gets tied to the larger mission because it's just such a focus. So I'd say there, the only other place that we might think about would be 
if you have some real slip fall issues on floors and that's driving some liability concerns, those are also hot items. So l let's, let's continue that, Dave. So I'm looking at my total building. There's obvious things that have to happen in the building. I agree with you. I think if you're serious about hygiene, you have to be serious about a public restroom because it's the epicenter of the biohazard waste transfer station. We know what's happening in there. Uh, the restroom is far more dangerous than, say, a lobby or a conference room or an <clears throat> entryway. Um, let's say that we put total focus on baking a better restroom solution. Where's kind of the second area that your clients are really focusing on? If they've solved for the restroom, where do they typically want to go next? I think it's the, the high traction areas, the, the, the spaces where the public is going to spend the most time in because that gets vis visibly run down. And it also does provide, like Alan said, the most opportunity for slip fall. So if you're talking retail grocery, think of all the products that end up in aisles that uh, can not only uh, you know, break and, and provide an issue with how we, how we address the spill and how we make this um, not just clean, but safe again. Yeah. And how do we stay out of that liability, but, but also how do we keep from damaging this asset of this floor finish or this floor program that we already have? Um, we have to kind of look to those areas because you're going to have some other more specialized areas mm -hmm. that you need to clean in, but, but they're going to have their own challenges that maybe the public does not see. Yeah. You know, so Dave, you bring up a good point about, you know, the high traffic areas, um, you know, these, these thoroughfares that happen in all of these buildings. Another thing, um, Nick, th that I think could be important for you to comment on is, you know, the seasons change and the needs of buildings change based off some of those seasons. You've played a big part in the risk reduction strategy. Um, What's an area that your clients are really kind of hypersensitive to? Alan talks a little bit about restrooms. Dave's talking a little bit about floor care. Where's another area that could be important to, to consider if I'm building a, you know, an improved program? Absolutely. So obviously, depending on where you're at in the country, we're going to be dealing with snow. We're going to be dealing with ice melt. And that stuff is eventually going to make its way into the building. So my clients are really hyper-focused on entryways, mitigating that risk because again, you're bringing in snow, it's eventually gonna melt. Um, that, that poses a risk to anybody who's you know, operating within that space. Yeah. So eliminating that before it makes its way into other areas of the building is So there's dangerous. a little bit of a theme brewing here, right? Because I'm gonna come back to you for a second is restrooms are important because everyone uses them and we inherently understand that the things that are happening in there could be dangerous. Dave's talking high traffic, Nick's talking about entryway, I'm, I'm hearing a theme of first impressions, right? And so... Yeah, I think it's two things. It's the places that matter that create impressions about your brand and customer loyalty, customer retention, whether that's parents or shoppers. But the other thing I think that's really interesting as I'm just listening is you have things you plan for. We know the restroom is going to be dirty every day. And then there's the things that are going to happen, but we just don't know when. Nick, I remember you telling me a story about being in a retail grocery and a display of spaghetti sauce crashes. Right. Like, you didn't know that was going to happen, but it's a mess. And, gotta, and you got to react gotta now. Yeah. Well, like it's, my coffee this morning. Yeah, exactly. Right? right. right. But so, it happens every day in every customer. People spill stuff, things happen, and you got to also have a system for rapid reaction. And you guys have kind of taught me this a little bit, you know, as I like look into some of your client base, you know, there are like these common causes and then there's the like special causes. So like if I, if I was this person looking to build a program from the scratch, I got to think about what's happening every single day in my building, maybe define four or five areas that are super important, but does my kind of system and subsystem allow me to react to the special cause like a display popping over, like a winter storm, like, you know, sand and debris and leaves? Because you guys know what happens here is once it starts, it just goes. And before you know it, a beautiful space is kind of overwhelmed by the environment. So uh, it's really interesting to kind of look at it that way 
There's things that have to happen every day. But there's also things that happen that you can't control, but you still got to be ready for them. And, and I think there's actually, if you if you really think this through, it <laughs> we don't, which we don't a lot of times. But this is the reality. Uh, you need a cleaning program, and you need a what do we do now program. Mm -hmm. Meaning, the building has never been more clean than between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. in the morning when nobody is in the building, right? So it's beautiful. Those restrooms are clean. You know, it smells nice. The yeah, floor is popping. Clean. You, I mean, you got it. But what happens when Gen Pop shows up <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, things happen? Yeah. So how do we react? What's, what's our plan when it matters, when people are in the I building? I love that. And, and so maybe that's how we'll close this question is, areas that matter, but how do we react when it's real, right? Mm -hmm. What's the value of a clean building if nobody sees it? Mm -hmm. yeah. But when we're live, live action, when the doors are open, right? And I've heard you guys preach, you know, when we're open, we're clean. When we're open, we're safe, right? right? That's very real. So I think that's great feedback uh, for this question is areas that matter. Focus in on what you're currently doing, uh, what could be happening here, and then probably tighten up on some things that you just know are a reality of your space and build a system and a subsystem around that. So that's great. I think that helps. You know, this question too, so you guys are talking about, okay, I got to react to all this stuff. Uh, this question was, I struggle to find... Uh, space for cleaning stuff. If I've got to do all these things that you guys just said was important, how do I react to kind of like the space challenge? I'm going to start with you. I've been kind of blown away at some of the clients that you serve. They're massive facilities, but kind of the space that the cleaning team gets, eh, that kind of gets skinning up a little bit. So I mean, how do we advise th this individual saying, hey, space is an issue? Right. What are your thoughts? So I think the first thing you need to look at is what tools do we have right now? Are those tools relevant to the outcome that we're looking to produce? Um, are those tools multifunctioning? So are they able to uh, perform multiple tasks on a single unit or on a single platform? If the answer to that is no, I think we get rid of those tools and we bring something in that is and is going to support the outcome that we're ultimately looking to accomplish. So the, the idea is making sure that the stuff you do have matters. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to make some investments, make sure that it can maybe impact, you know, question one, multiple areas. Right. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, the sizing of equipment, how you advise. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, you really have to think about, again, what's my aim? What's my available time window of labor? Like, let's say I've got this amount of time to do it. And there's some restrictions that could happen. If you're in a school, your time may be when the kids are in class. I've got to do all these things when the kids are in class in the other areas. And then when the kids go to those areas, I've got to go back and clean where they So you've got to clean where they aren't, right? And every building has its own flow. So understanding what are your challenges around when you can clean helps you size, right? So start with what's my available time and then what's the volume of cleaning I need to do with number of fixtures. That's interesting. So you got to put those two things together because you could say, hey, I mean, mops are, I mean, it's easy to use anywhere, but it's slow and it takes a long time to dry. So there are applications like a front entrance way in a storm where you're taking a bucket of water to clean up water to leave water. Let that sink in. Yes. Hmm. So, but I'm just saying, like, think about that. You got to react quick and you're trying to remove liquid. You need to think about the volume you're trying to do, how much time you have to plan. Right. The, think about so it. I think that's system. awesome. Tell me a little sure. bit about this because. He's onto something here. When you think of time to clean, that could dictate the size of the machine that maybe you need. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of battery technology out there that's tied to run time. Pile, pile on here a little bit about well, making these selections. Well, what I was, what I was noodling is, as you were talking with, this is the entry point to discuss how do you workload a building, basically. So it, you, if you look at the entirety of the challenge, you, you really have to take what do I have equipment, what do I have with labor, 
what are my challenges with the people in the building, like you're saying, with kids in classes, kids in the other side of the building and gym, class or out of the building, on recess or whatever, depending on the school size or the school, you know, elementary or high school. Like, what am I doing to take the available equipment to have it in the right place at the right time to get the maximum outcome <laughs> that I, I need it. to get? Because as soon as kids leave, again, just like we can shut the lights off at midnight at any retail store, we got plenty of time to make this thing look good again. Right. But what are we doing while we're in the building to maximize uh, what we can do? And to your point, battery technology, great, awesome, safe. You know, it's safe, no cords, no. So when you're dealing around people, you can use the battery, but the battery has a time limit, right? right? So do I, have to, do I have to really think through my workloading program to say, I have an hour on this battery where I can get these things done on this side of the building, and I have another battery that's on a charger on the other side. I take this one off, I put it on the charge, I make my way to the other side of the building when it's time, I put a new fresh battery on and I can keep going. Yeah. I don't have to you know, parse up my cleaning so badly or go back and forth to a closet to where um, I understand that the equipment is meant to enhance the overall result and not just, not just to the building, but to the impact of my people and to the time spent, to the dollar we put, you know, to that actual task. So yeah, it's a great point. You know, the automatic scrubber is the most expensive thing that most people buy in their cleaning program. And in order to save a little money, we might shrink the size of scrubber. But now we need to clean for an hour. Our water only lasts 30 minutes because we didn't size it right. So now we've got to travel back, empty 20 gallons of water, clean out the machine, refill it to go back and finish the job. We gave up 25 to 30% of our productivity because we didn't buy the right size machine every day. Yeah. And that's where I was going to go next with you, Nick, is you have seen some clients potentially overbuy in this scenario where, kind of going back to the space thing is, I've got these single purpose machines, going back to Dave, is do all those single purpose machines kind of fit into my available time, my available labor? Because they all are associated with a cost. They all have to be maintained. They can't all be used at the same time. You know, overbuying for all of your tasks can also limit that space question. How have you kind of helped clients um, not overbuy. I'm looking for you to kind of talk about the multi-purpose just a little bit here of, do I really need all these individual pieces of equipment or do I need to rethink today's point, what am I actually trying to do? How have you helped? Well, I mean, I think it all goes back to what we discussed early on in this episode is, you know, we got to talk about what's important right now first. So if um, a client is focused on restrooms and that's their number one concern, let's start there. But if we can take that same unit and get a similar or better result in another area of the building with that same unit, that's going to be more important than buying several units yeah. that serve only one purpose. And so that's the win is, you know, and that's why you got to take the time to yeah. identify what's truly important because then you got to build your system around that. So uh, keep in mind too that that multiple pieces of equipment mean multiple, um, there, there's many things you have to learn to operate each piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of, of, you know, uh, of places don't have specialized cleaners. They have to do it all. Mm -hmm. So they have to understand that, that I need to know the scrubber and all the aspects of the scrubber and I need to know you know, uh, another floor care, you know, piece, yeah, or I need to know, or, yeah, I gotta, right. yeah. I, I have to know all these pieces and then toss in there some turnover and you get a new employee that has to learn new products. And it, it's, if you can limit and, and get multiple tasks out of a few pieces of equipment, then you've maximized to a training program. Yeah. You've brought your people up to snuff on a lot of areas that they can impact. Yeah, we're going to tackle the, I have a training question here um, that's going to speak to that. I'm, I'm going to wait a second on that question because 
I think this ties into the question that you and I got asked the other day on one of our panel interviews is, great, guys, awesome. I, I have the right scope of work. I'm going to make the investment, let's say, in a multi-purpose piece of equipment that provides impact. And it fits my labor model. Awesome. But how do I know the things that I'm purchasing are actually being not just utilized, but to your guys' point, being maximized? And so we were on that panel discussion. I wrote that one in because yeah. that was a kind of a shot back in that panel. It was going, great. Let's say we do all this stuff. How do I know that it's actually happening? You got any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Because the industry is well, changing fast. It is. And one of the biggest topics is data, right? In all aspects of businesses. At Kyvac, we talk about data, how to use data, how to be smarter to serve our customers with data, build better machines with data. We have a data conversation every, every day. day. And so does everybody who's watching this. So data is a big deal. We need to drive not just the accumulation of data, but turning that into actionable intelligence. In all of our machines, we put an IoT sensor that allows us to see if the machine was turned on or used. And, but really what we're solving for is what's broken in the system? What's the data telling us is broken in the system? So we see the machine doesn't run for seven days. Do, is that because we had turnover and we didn't train somebody new? Or is that because we had a part that failed or somebody just, the person before me left it in terrible Maybe shape? They gave up yeah, and pushed it to the Got corner. frustrated and, and, or the battery died and nobody thought to plug it in and charge it. How many times have you go to grab your drill and you got <laughs> nothing? You're like, man. That's the worst. Yeah, because you should have thought about charging it before you got to the point where you needed it. Right. So all the, but the data just says it didn't ran. I just ran off like five different things. So what happens is people start chasing. The easiest thing to do is just blame the worker. Well, you should have fixed that, right? Well, it's a system problem, right? Deming says 94% of the problem, if you're getting a bad outcome, is from the system and only 6% is from the people. In cleaning, we have that flipped. We blame the worker 94% of the time, and 6% we try and buy new stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that's a good one. So um, smart machines have been a big part. Uh, you guys spent a lot of time in retail, big box. Um, talk a little bit about some of the value of a smart machine. Less about data and actual intelligence. Why do your guys' customers think they want data? Because it kind of goes to this question. Just curious, what, what, if I just put you on the spot there on that one, what would you say? Um, I mean, I would say that they, at some times, don't really know why they want the data. They just know that they want the data. Um, and the, the first reason is, well, we want to make sure that our people are using it, right? right? We want to make sure that these systems are being used, these uh, investments that we're making, we want to make sure that they're, you know, they're, they're being maximized. Um, so that's number one. Um, but it goes back to what Alan just said, right? There's, there's multiple pieces to that data that allows you to have that actual intelligence. We put a battery sensor also on our machine. So we can track as the battery goes down, we can see when the battery's charged. That allows us to see a pattern. So we could predictively know that, hey, we're starting to see a machine that didn't get charged, which is different than, it's gonna lead to it didn't get used, but we can get in front of that and make sure that we reach out. It's the difference between reaching out after the fact saying, hey, why did you do it wrong? and then coaching and mentoring and giving people a, you know, kind of a, hey, looks like you're getting stuck with charging. Anything we can do to help you understand how or why or when. So I think it's all the same, comes back to trying to get to the root cause, which is, is my system running effectively? And that's what data does, is it shows you where should you be focused on your system to improve it. Yeah, but I, I'd come over the top of this with you guys just because I get to watch a lot of your deals and I'm involved with a lot of your customer is, 
I think there's a code here that data equals visibility. Right. Okay. And so for a lot of our clients who might have had multiple layers of human oversight, those positions have been eliminated or reduced. And so they've lost a little bit of control of some of their programs. So they have this desire to have visibility, say from the corporate office or from an outreach center to your point. So I see the data discussion and the hunger for it is because people lost some of that visibility. But I think what you guys are all saying is, okay, now what do I do with it? So it's visible. How do I then, you know, kind of push the right message to the field? Because I think in that panel, what he's saying is one thing is about utilizing, the other thing is about maximizing. Because the company bought <clears throat> a piece of technology or a piece of innovation to get a return. Right. And so that's the maximization. So just thoughts on that. I'll tell you a funny story, right? We first started putting sensors on. I was working with a customer at a location and I'd gone in, made sure we were set up. People were trained. We had a good system. System runs for a while. Looking at the data, we see a problem. We don't have any usage. So I go back in, we retrain, come back a couple of weeks later, we start to see the problem, no usage. So I go and I talk to the worker. I said, so what's going on with the machine? She said, I love the machine. I said, so what's, tell me what's going on. She's like, it tells on me. So I stopped using it. So because what they were saying, they were making assumptions and blaming the worker because they were looking at the data sometimes too granularly like, we thought you would run this 30 minutes a day. You ran it 25 minutes. What was going on? <laughs> right. She's like, I ain't dealing with this. She just parked it. <laughs> right. right. So sometimes it's, again, when you're blaming the worker, you're getting the data. You can overanalyze data. In the, you got to get to that point you're asking, what, how do we maximize right. the investment? And we talked earlier about sometimes things happen that you can't control. Mm -hmm. So she may have only used it 25 minutes because there was a flood and she used something else to save something that was an emergency and... But got dinged for it, got yeah. dinged potentially. For it. Yeah. Is that where you were going? Well, I have two thoughts here. Um, based on what you just said about visibility, I think this has a lot to do with the bigger the, the, bigger the client is, the customer is, visibility is a really, really terrible issue. And, and communication on <laughs> what the program is really you know, doing or what's the purpose, they lose that too. So when it comes to some of this data and some of the feedback, it, it's, about, it's about is it being used, but it's also about managing a fleet of equipment, which mm -hmm. is a massive undertaking um, because there's multiple pieces of equipment inside of that <laughs> client's um, you know, portfolio. And how do, we, how do we say, when it comes to a capital investment, we spent the right money because the payback's so good because we can see the numbers, all right? But that's one portion of it. The other portion is, I think we, I think we, uh, we get real narrow on our focus with turn the machine on, turn the machine off, did we do a thing? There's so many stakeholders that might be attached to um, the result of this, little thing mm -hmm. that it, it it creates waves all over everybody's kind of got their own agenda well meaning how they're looking at it right we sell a a cooler case cleaner that cleans inside of your refrigerated cases right um we're looking at a cleaning function did they turn it on did they clean the cooler did they walk away that's that's a minor piece of this because it has to happen but the way that it tidal waves up is that how much energy did we save? I mean, let's, let's extrapolate that out. If you have thousands of locations and you can save a little energy just by a clean cooler, a clean mm -hmm. coils, right? Yeah. How much energy do we save? It's, all, it's, it's out of the roof. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Food loss. So if these freeze and we lose our product inside, what do we do about that? We throw it all away. That's a big, big, big problem, right? 
So, so it's not just about cleaning. It's about how does the cleaning then, you know, go to the next thing and the next thing to make a program be so valuable. So data points, they mean something. It's getting the stakeholders to, to talk together about what that cleaning function was to get those data points to line up to this means something to the company. And this what, what, do, what do most of us want to do? We want some magic software that tells us how to do all this. And this was, you know, the next question. I think it's a very logical question for someone to ask. You know, saying we're looking at software, okay, because we're kind of talking a little bit about data. Okay, we're talking about actual software where Dave's going here. Software to help us manage cleaning. Any thoughts about programs we should look at? Yeah, it's a great question. I would say going back to what's your aim? Because there's work order management software, there's work loading software, there's work loading application software. The software, this is where people get it wrong, right? The software isn't your system. Your system is your system and your software gives you visibility to how efficient you're running your system. It's not the other way around. You don't buy software to, to run your cleaning program. Right. So that's where people, because software, no matter what it is, requires a lot of data input. If you've got a software that's gonna workload, are you putting in every location, the location type, the location size, the flooring sizes, the fixtures, all the different cleaning functions? Who's doing that? How do you get all of the information you need into a software? one and once it's there is it running your system or now is it trying to say no i want you to run my system which may not align i've just seen this over the years because there's been a proliferation of different types of software systems i think the work order management systems have become really efficient and really good the janitorial work loading systems haven't kind of gotten there yet because I think people have not answered the, what, what's important to us? What kind of time do we have? The software can't tell you that. Yeah, You have, you to, have to know inputs. that. When you know that, the software helps you run it more efficiently. So make sure that you've got the right objective of when you're evaluating software, that you're not looking for the answer. You know the answer. You're looking for the software to help you validate the answer and improve it. That's a pretty good answer. I'm going to give you that because <laughs> a lot of people are thinking software is the end all be all. It's going to solve the problem. It, it, it's a part of it. We've all dealt with sales people. We do stuff in sales our whole lives. You know, there's CRMs. We've been through a bunch of them, right? If you don't change the system, it doesn't matter which CRM you buy. Yeah. You still have a failed and frustrated management and worker, right? But when you get people aligned to the value of having all that information in the right, in this place, in this, and what it can tell you about helping your clients, that's when things start to line up. Yeah, so let's go a totally different direction here. There's a question here that I think is on the minds of anybody that's running a facility, okay? You're talking software, you're talking multi-purpose, you're talking, you know, maybe looking at my labor and what are my individual pieces of equipment. You know what I hear? Expense. And those are things that are real. And one of the questions was, I continue to struggle with my budget as I'm being asked to do more, but my budget is shrinking, okay? And I think some of this is coming out of a post-COVID world. I think that you could go, there's economic pressures that are out there in our society right now. But I do know for a fact that typically janitorial is kind of one of those first ones to get skinnied up. And so we're talking software, we're talking innovation, we're talking training. You guys are talking data and all this really cool futuristic stuff. If my budget's constantly getting slashed, how do I kind of operate as a facility manager in this reality yeah. and how do i make the right decisions well it's a great question so you've got budget and then you've got kind of what you want and they rarely line up 
So what I think we've done really well at Kayak is help people once we identified what's the problem we're solving. We've kind of documented your current state, what a potential future state would look at, is let's put the financial numbers to like it. Like how do you fund that gap? That's and then understand how to talk finance, right? So it's building good business cases. Sometimes it's payback. Sometimes it's internal rate of return, right? You, you're looking at, can I take money out of my annual operating budget and move it into capital? Sometimes that's organizations want to do that. There's other times where it's like, we don't have any capital. So you got to move expenses into the operating budget through creative financing. All those things come together, but no deal happens without making a financial justification. But it's got to be tied to the aim. What are we trying to solve for? Right? We, we talk a lot about how meaningful to the organization would this be if we solved it. Mm -hmm. So once people understand, like, on a 1 to 10, this is something we really need to fix. Like, yeah. this is a 7, 8, 9 problem. And then how unique and well thought out is our solution. So if we have meaningfully high and high unique and we can make numbers work, we've never had a problem getting the money. But if you don't have all that baked in, why is this important? How are we going to execute it? What does it do for the financial health of the business? If you can't answer all those things, then you're going to struggle to get the money. I'm going to you next, Dave, and here's why. I think he lays out an important thing that piggybacks off what you're saying. Like, if we go back to these areas that matter, is it not fair to say that sometimes our budget would never be able to address the whole body of work? So how have you advised clients that maybe tie budget back into what you were saying earlier about areas that matter? Maybe you can't do it all. Yeah. It Obviously, you can't do it all. I mean, what I want and what I, what I have available are never the same. I mean, occasionally, you know, there's a, there's a payday and you get to buy something and, and you know, you, you get to impact something immediately. But for the most part, um, you, learn to, you learn to prioritize. And I think what Alan said is most important. If you're not, if you're not consistently working off a business case, then, then there's no actual measuring tool to what, what's the value of what you're even asking for, yeah. right? So, so I, I do think if you're gonna prioritize the task and you do have some funds available, it may make sense for you to then begin to build your system that is, that, that's got phases. You know, I, can, I have some of, my, some of the budget money that's available to me I can purchase some of these things this year and next year when I get that same budget, uh, I'll be able to phase this in in a couple of years, right? That's interesting, but you're talking about prioritizing and I think that's good feedback for the audience is that you're, you may be skinny down. You got to look at what is the most critical thing that I got to solve for in this month, this quarter, this year, and how does the budget that I have apply to solving that problem? I think that's, I mean, you just spelled that out. In a, in a pretty succinct way of just saying, you can't have it all, what do you have to have? And how do you plan but, for it? But there's some things you can take off the table too in that process. If you build a business case, let's say, let's go back to the restroom. If you build a business case for the restroom and you said, I would like to, I would like to buy this piece of equipment that does this. Well, what did you take off the table that that replaced? Mm -hmm. So now you've got some more of your budget to put back into this system, right? So, so you're able to pull back on purchasing some things you don't need to put back in your closet and you're putting in the closet the thing that matters and if you can make it through season one and get to season two and you have a full team of, of what you're trying to accomplish, uh, you've removed a bad practice and you've put a better practice in place and now you're tracking results yeah. and you're... Yeah. Th this guy knows a thing or two about that. I, I, I watched with a couple of your clients go down a similar path and there wasn't a connection being made that if we do this, we don't have to do this. We just keep buying this because it's what we've always done. But you're like, well, wait a minute. We, we could maybe take eight to 10 SKUs out 
be, because this applies. W what's that process like where you're, <laughs> you're, you're looking at it and making decisions on what stays and what goes? How, how have you approached that with clients? Um, I think it just goes back to having, <clears throat> excuse me, tough conversations mm -hmm. and really interrogating reality, as we like to say around here, are these tools necessary to the outcome that you're looking to achieve? If they're not, let's get rid of them and let's invest in areas that are important. There's always, I, I like to start to that interrogation. There's three questions. What do you think is happening? What's really happening? And what should we be doing? Mm -hmm. Right? And when you just kind of stop and think about it that way, because we think we've got this thing dialed. We go out into the field and it's not as dialed. Mm -hmm. Then we have a choice. We either have to retrain to Dave's point back to what we thought was happening, or we could retrain to maybe something better. Right. We're going to have to invest the time into training. That's all part of writing a really good business case. Because if you came to me and said, hey, I want to buy this new thing, I'd be like, well, what about the thing I bought you five years ago? Well, this thing is a lot better. Well, are you using the other thing? Like, there's all these conversations. Well, and it also goes back to the system approach to what you're saying. So if, if we bought a bunch of things, in the cleaning world, unfortunately, that thing that's on that shelf, the application of how that gets used, it's up to me, mm -hmm. right? Where I use it, completely up to me. So, so the system is not, it's not in place to get the result that you actually want. So when you, when you buy a process or when you're gonna initiate a process that should have a result and you're training around that process, then your system should be more complete, mm -hmm. right? You should get results based on the system's outcome. So if you, for example, that machine, if you, if you go through the, the steps, then you get the result. It's, it's the way the machine functions. It's how it, it's the only thing it can do, mm -hmm. right? So we're gonna train you on how it functions. We're gonna give you information that you can keep at any time and get to at any time to know how it functions but you're gonna get the result every time. Instead of, here's a cleaning cart with 25 things on it, go clean that bathroom. If I'm a cleaner, yeah, I don't wanna get subjective. my head in that toilet. I don't wanna, <laughs> you know, there's too many opportunities to cut corners, to, to stop the system in its tracks, yeah. right? Well, what about a couple tough questions? Who's up yeah. for one? Let's do it. All right, because I, I think there's two more on this list that were submitted that probably shouldn't be ignored. Um, one is, again, great guys, thanks for the help with the system. Nicholas, thanks for giving me some multi-purpose innovation. Dave, thank you for the focus on the areas that matter. Both of you guys, thanks for giving me a little visibility and data. Uh, thank you guys for helping with the training, like you see how big this is. Okay, um, now I have a repair. Now, now my, my, what I've invested in is down. and so. We hear this question a lot. I'm having trouble getting broken machines repaired, replaced. Any ideas? So you guys just, you laid out some real fundamental sharp stuff, but at the end of the day, yeah. things break. Now what? Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, when you think about systems, there's two things that have to be true. The people have to be able, and the machine has to be able. Yeah. So we're talking about the second one. What, I, and machines break. Right now, first of all, like now when I buy a car, I'm thinking about reliability and serviceability as one of the top factors, mm -hmm. right? It used to be, I'd go ask my buddy, the shade tree mechanic, which car do I think and what could he fix? That's not the way people buy cars anymore, all right? Could I fix it myself? My dad was always under the hood you don't do any of that anymore, right? So cars have become very reliable, very durable. And the process, the system is you rarely ever need to have it down. Mm -hmm. Cleaning is kind of the opposite. So we are kind of still back in that shade tree mechan mechanic world where it breaks, we kind of have two things that happen. I get frustrated and just park it right? Just, uh, or 
my default is, well, I'll just call a technician. Okay, but, you know, at 300 bucks a clip just to get people to come and do a evaluation before the parts and the return trip to fix it. This machine, we build a system around this machine. Now it doesn't work for two weeks. Now I've got total collapse of my morale, my outcomes. So what I tell people is, and I know there's a lot of people in presentations, we've even, I personally have even gotten sucked into this where we're talking about, hey, we have this great service network. If that's what people are leading with, you probably have got the wrong approach. What you really want are machines that are very dependable and that are very easy to fix yourself. Because if your system is, when it breaks, I either, you know, first, the person operating it then goes to some manager and says it's not working. And they're like, okay, well, what, is not what do you want me to do? Right. You want me to buy a part? Do I need to call somebody? The worker's like, I don't know, right? I don't know the part numbers. I don't know where to call. Like, there's just a, I mean, there's just a lot that breaks here. So the default is, well, let's just call somebody. And then the budget gets blown up. When we talk about finding money, back to your refrigerated case, one of the biggest ways we find money is we stop service calls, right? That could have been prevented by a good system around how we keep machines working. So the thing I would tell somebody who's thinking about repairs is flip the script, not who has a great network. How can I avoid needing one in my evaluation? <laughs> um, uptime mm -hmm. is a big thing, shrinking that gap as it relates to, let's just say that we don't have massive problems <clears throat> with our technologies. What are some of the things that you're doing to help streamline uptime and quick fix? Um, there's, there's a lot of lot of opportunity there to go faster. What are some ways that you could maybe guide the audience on keeping it up and running, maybe when it's not completely broken, but it needs something? Right, and I think it's, it's really a three-parter. So you, you need to give uh, the user the knowledge to be able to, the knowledge and confidence to be able to fix that system on their own, mm -hmm. but it needs to be easy to fix on their own. Uh, but you also, they need to have the motivation and the want to fix that system. If they don't know what that system does or how it's used, when it breaks, they're just going to push it to the side and grab something that they know how. So I think it also goes into training and, and training that individual on what that system is, what it does, why it's important to their brand, and then giving them the confidence to be able to fix that unit on give, their Give own. me two examples. What, what are some things that you've done with your clients? Let, let's go at the end user level. What are two ways that you've empowered clients to get their uptime faster? I think number one is proper training and customized training and training to the specific task and the specific issue. So whether it's a cleaning task or whether it's uh, a troubleshooting tip and trick. Okay. Um, so that's number one. Number two is just access to uh, part numbers. When, when they need a replacement part, do they have the access to, the, to those part numbers to be able to take action. We're coming right back over there. So again, what Alan says, if you're listening to the system thinking, it's gotta be visible, right? So he's saying, how do we make that stuff visible? I need the blue thing. Yeah. I need the thingamabobby. You know, Mr. GM, you know, the, the, the red thing that's on the side of the machine, I need one of those. That's not what you're talking about. You're talking about in the training, and in kind of the uptime portion of what it takes to keep a piece of equipment running, bringing that system visible, so whether it's a wall chart, whether it's a QR code, whether it's an app, we've got to make the systems visible so people know where to take action. Dave, another thing that I've watched your, your clients do is, when stuck, where do I go? Like we have to provide the raise the hand moment for this industry, and the reason I think this is important is there is a churn. There is turnover, and so maybe you transferred Language some knowledge barrier. to me. Maybe I understand what you're saying to me. Maybe I don't. Uh, this is very real. And um, making the system visible but also available to your team is important because sometimes you're, you're the next guy up. Uh, and so I've watched you put a couple programs in place of, it's kind of like ask the expert, but it's more about like on the ground, 
I got to know when to raise my hand and where I'm going. Any thoughts on that, Dave? I, I mean, obviously, I have thoughts. I, I'm not sure that they will enhance anything that's been said so far. Um, just because you could, you could literally rack your head over how can I answer to the problem uh, for a person at two in the morning who's using a piece of equipment of mine and it doesn't work because it's missing the blue thingy and you know I don't know where the training is we aren't allowed to use our phones I mean stuff like that that you have to you have to get inside of the actual brain of the customer to understand what do you want <laughs> what do you want this program to look like so we can build the yeah, program I love, I love the, where he's going yeah. I, and we, I, I think that I want to I want to take this in a direction of potentially the concept of culture comes into this conversation mm -hmm. and so what Dave is saying is we got to understand what's going on here well there's also a culture of how to do things and how to solve you want to piggyback on that a little bit yeah absolutely I mean you said it before it's this if we're open, we're clean. Like cleaning is an expectation in public buildings, right? It's just post COVID, it is absolutely an expectation that we're cleaning to a high level that we've got clean, healthy, safe environments. So the cleaning worker actually becomes part of this real brand value proposition. So when you really get this alignment to the business value and where cleaning plays into it, to your point, Nick's point about motivating that cleaner. Like if I, uh, if I need, if there's something I need to use and it's not working the way I want, I may go to YouTube, I may jump on, I may go to the company's website. Like usually I quickly find an answer. I might find it in a forum. Somewhere I find the answer real quick and then I make a determination. Can I fix this? Because I need to use that thing. Like I'm grilling ribs in an hour and my thing isn't working. Like <laughs> yeah. I need to like be ready or I need to abort, right? Yeah. Like, so that's kind of that, that culture of clean. Yeah. Um, if, it, if it's meaningful, if it's an area that matters, well then we got to get the kind of the intrinsic and extrinsic motivators of the people that are doing that work to achieve that outcome, Absolutely. right? That, that's when you really make the change is when you have a culture of clean. And that's a system. Yeah, that, that's a system in itself that you're you're working on that system to benefit the system below it. Right. So this system of what happens when it's almost the decision tree. What happens when this happens? We, we have to have a, a straight line to make this system function. Still. Yeah, th that's the visibility right? that I think I'm talking about yeah. is providing those tools that give people the decision tree not what we typically see in the industry is that's not my problem yeah. or that's above my pay grade and the net result is something gets underutilized and now you start this whole cycle of dysfunction and okay i'm gonna get real yeah. as an industry we love wall charts yeah we've been in a lot of janitor's closets how effective are wall charts <laughs> right where are they are they refreshed things change do they have part numbers on them? Are they in the right language? language this right. gets really hard. So it's like, here's what we think we're doing. But when you get out in reality, the other thing I'll say to Dave's point, I thought it's a great one. As people are raising the issues, hey, I'm struggling with the blue thingy. And you hear it a few times. You've got to really be listening because you've got an issue you need to solve for with some communication and support. Yeah. So. We've been hearing collectively for over a hundred years about odors from restroom floors. Like we need to wake up and say, we probably need to change something, <laughs> right? Because for, we've tried a lot of stuff and it didn't really solve the problem. So we're going to have to take a different approach. Yeah. So I think we've covered a ton of ground here. This has been great conversation. And what the hope of, of this is, is to get into the minds of, of the audience and let them continue to pour into us of what they're thinking. I mean, I appreciate your guys' insight. I think we covered some like major things that I know were happening and on the minds in 2024. We just need to continue to keep communicating, building out this knowledge, 
let everybody know that we're here to help. So thanks for joining. Uh, ask the experts. We'll see you guys on the next episode.